Attention passengers, today on Strangers on a Podcast, we have a hidden gem from 2002 that can best be described as Grumpy Old Men meets Ghostbusters. It contains an elderly Elvis Presley, a black John F. Kennedy, and a cowboy dressed as a mummy. Join us, won't you? Hello and welcome to the movie car here on Strangers on a Podcast. I'm the conductor and with me is... I'm Grimweed. Hello, Grimweed. Hello. Now, what is Strangers on a Podcast about? We're a podcast featuring two guys who do not know each other talking about movies and how they bring people together. Uh, how's that going to work? Are, are we going to drive each other nuts? Maybe. Are we going to stay on topic? Hopefully. Probably not. Well, we, we might. Uh, today, we bring you Strangers on a Podcast discussing the one and the only... Bubba Hotep. That is right, Bubba Hotep starring. If you couldn't tell by that little intro, Bubba what, Hotep. What, what else needs to be said? It's it's grumpy old men meets Ghostbusters. It is a lot of things. Metaphors for just being happy with what you have and and don't take things for granted. It, it's a it's a deep movie. It's a it's a heartfelt movie. Okay, I know. Last last time you you kind of led the way. Mm-hmm. Um. Into way too much time, into way too much stuff. Which I'm not saying we're not going to do that this time, but I want to try something and see see how it works. Okie dokie. Um, so I'm going to just run through real quick a basic synopsis of the movie. Mm-hmm. And then once I get through that, we can just break it down scene by scene if we want to, because there's a lot of, of this movie to unpack. There is. Okay, so I'll try and make this quick. Here we go. It starts out with, defin- with with definitions of a couple words. Hotep is defined as a relative or descendant of the 17 Egyptian dynasties from 3100 to 1550 BC and family surname of an Egyptian pharaoh or a king. If that goes away, we get Bubba, defined as a male from the southern U.S., good old boy, cracker, redneck, trailer park resident. That sums it up. So the, the movie stars Bruce Campbell as Elvis Presley and or Sebastian Half. Depending on your point of view. Yes, depending on how you take this movie. The brilliant Ozzie Davis as Jack or possibly John F. Kennedy. Ella Joyce is the nurse. Bob Ivey, he was our mummy. Bob Hotel. Yes. Uh, Larry Pennell was Kimasabi. And Larry Pennell has been around forever as well and done lots of westerns. Um and Reggie Bannister from Phantasm and pretty much all but one movie that Don Coscarelli has ever done. And he said he would never do a movie without Reggie Bannister again. Ha. Huh. We have Daniel Roebuck and Daniel Schweiger as the Hearst Drivers. Who are comic relief in the film. Yes. Um, Harrison Young, who plays an, an, a dying Private Ryan. Oh, I remember. Or also Elvis's roommate. And... Heidi Marnow as Callie, who's Private Ryan's daughter. I wonder if this movie goes on in the same world as Private Ryan. I like to think it does, but watching Private Ryan at the end and you see the family, tr- then try and pick out which one Callie is. That adds a weird twist to this movie. <laughs> well, actually, I, I think it wouldn't work because I just remember uh, seeing his family and how well-dressed they were. I, I don't think they would have put him in as cheap a home as, the, as this one Hard as this times, film portrays. Man. Everyone else is dead. She she ends up stripping to make rent. Yeah, could happen. This introduction went south quick. Poor old Ryan. Yeah. Poor Private Ryan. Earned this. Whew. Okay. So, real quick. Uh, an old man named Sebastian Half claims to be the real Elvis Presley and lives at the Shady Rest Retirement Home in Mud Creek, Texas. He claims that he and Sebastian Half, who is an Elvis impersonator, had switched places after Elvis, has grown, Elvis had grown weary of the demands of fame, and it was Sebastian that died in 1977, while the real Elvis was living happily and earning a living by passing himself off as, well, I mean, himself, really, right? As an Elvis impersonator. Exactly. When Sebastian, the fake Elvis, died, and the real Elvis, passing himself off as Sebastian Half, lost his copy of the contract the two had in a tragic barbecue accident which was one hell of a barbecue accident yeah it, it, it hit the budget a little 
I imagine. So yeah, when, when that happens, Elvis can no longer prove that he is the real Elvis and kind of decides he would just be an Elvis impersonator. And then... Live on the road, baby. Yeah. He had a hip swivel accident and he fell off the stage and broke his hip. And then it got infected. He went into a coma for a while. And this is 20 years after the accident, which brings us to the present, present where Elvis is reflecting on his age and dignity with his only companion, a man named Jack, who claims to be none other than John F. Kennedy. Jack claims to be John F. Kennedy and insists, insists that Lyndon Johnson abandoned him in a nursing home, is trying to kill him, and dyed him black so no one would notice. Uh, Ozzie Davis delivers an amazing performance in the film where he you will start to believe line. that he's actually john f kennedy and he, but he says flat out they dyed me this color yeah an egyptian mummy was stolen during a museum tour of the united states and later it was lost when a bus went off the bridge near the nursing home who must eventually be fought by elvis and jack the mummy dresses as a cowboy and consumes the souls of people in the home and elvis gives him the nickname bubba hotep after gazing into its eyes causes a flashback elvis and jack come up with a complex plan to get rid of the mummy in the middle of the night elvis and jack fight the mummy in an electric wheelchair and using an improvised flamethrower which i guess it wasn't really much of a flamethrower as it was yeah it was it was basically just like a, a weed sprayer that that was flammable if you put a light if you put a zippo next to it and yeah. i i always got the impression when when bella hotep and elvis lock dies i always got the impression that like uh like information was being downloaded into elvis's brain like through some sort of telepathy or something like uh when they locked eyes like elvis was able to like either either but bubba hotep was like yeah it, somehow it, there and, was some kind of a psychic thing going on yeah Oh uh, yeah. So Elvis and Jack are fighting the mummy in the in the wheelchair using the not so flamethrower flamethrower. Unfortunately, the mummy knocks Jack out of the wheelchair and Elvis hops in to save Jack before the mummy can steal his soul, sprays him down, lights him on fire. Hilarity ensues as Jack dies. There's a nice tribute to John F. Kennedy before the mummy gets up, says a few words, pisses Elvis off, and they end up in a fight that flies them off a cliff. Well, it may as well have been a cliff to them, but it looked like a really steep hill to me. Yeah, so that's basically the synopsis of the movie. So, um, I mean, how do you really describe this movie to somebody other than this is Elvis and a black JFK fighting a cowboy mummy? You have to you have to prepare yourself to be laughed at when you describe the film to people because there's a pretty good chance if they've never heard of it or never seen it, or maybe they just aren't in the right kind of cult-minded limber sensibility they're just gonna laugh their ass off at you for even mentioning a, a movie that sounds as ridiculous as this well especially when the movie starts out with the german was not translated right but it's an actual newsreel of finding mummies in egypt it cuts to the present and the first words we hear that aren't narration of a translated newsreel is i was dreaming Dreaming my dick was out, and I was checking to see if that infected bump on the head of it was filled with pus again. If it had, I was going to name that bump after my ex-wife, Scylla, and bust it by jacking off. Or I'd like to think that's what I would do. Dreams let you think like that. Truth was, I hadn't had a hard-on in years. That is the opening words to this movie. It makes an impression. Yeah. Right out the gate. Yeah, it, it sets the tone. Not only that, but the... The opening words of the movie are all being spoken in Elvis's head as he sort of narrates his own adventure. Yes, that 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 is true. I should should have been clear. It was a narration from our hero. But you know, and I'm going to call him Elvis because I'm just on uh, I'm on Team Elvis for this. I'm I, I I look at him when I watch this movie. I don't think oh there's old Sebastian. Nope, it's Elvis. I call him Elvis. He he was Elvis. I mean it it was confirmed by everybody, including the the writer of the book, Joe R. Lansdale. It was a novella. Yeah, it was a, a story by Joe R. Lansdale, who's pretty respected uh, Western and, and crime novelist, from what I understand. There's very few changes to his story there. That I mean, they added a couple little things, which we'll get to, but pretty much if that was in the book, there it is. But yeah, if, if we didn't start out weird enough, our elderly private Ryan roommate has a bit of a cough, cough, gasp, gasp moment, and then not so quietly passes away. It's not pretty to watch either. No. 
it's kind of a grim intro. Yeah, but it, it also has the comedic tone that uh, sets it, sets itself apart really early, um, where Elvis is sort of this detached viewer in his own life and watches his roommate die and just watches and, and tries to talk to the guy as it happens and can't really do anything about it. And nobody in the nursing home rushes to the man's aid and Elvis has to just watch it and then lean back in his bed and let it be because... For all we know, this has been like the third or fourth roommate Elvis has had. It's four and a half minutes in before we even find out this is Elvis. When he mentions he went from uh, being the king of rock and roll to an old guy in a rest home in East Texas with a growth on his pecker. It never shows the growth. So no. just everybody out there who might be worried about, you know, I don't want to see no movie about a guy with a growth on his pecker. Ew. No, it never shows the growth. I mean, normally, if you think of Bruce Campbell movies, there's a lot of low-budget bad movies, which nothing against him, and he even admits he's done a lot of low-budget bad movies. But if there's a line about a growth on his pecker, it's usually in there for comedic value. This actually, I think, serves a purpose. It goes a long way towards the growth of the character, I think. The mm -hmm. growth of the character is reflected in the growth on his dick. But yeah, so after Private Ryan's death, then that's when we first meet the, the hearse drivers, Daniel Roebuck and Daniel Schweiger. A pair of Daniels. Yes. Um, but yeah, they're they're going to show up pretty much after every death as mm -hmm. a little bit of comic relief and kind of a, now that was bad, let, let's bring a little laugh into it before we throw you into the next scene. And there's a great soundtrack, kind of a like a, a great musical cue that happens every time the two guys are pulling a body out of the rest home. It's like just this laid back guitar song playing when they, you know, dun, ba, dun, 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 dun. yeah, Brian Tyler did amazing with the music on this, which uh, sadly they could not afford any Elvis music for the film. No, it would have cost, it, it, would, it would have taken half the budget for this movie when they're flipping through the TV. There's not even an Elvis shown in the TV channels yeah they uh they they have to use footage from old frankie avalon public domain movies yeah that's all from a french music video from like the 60s or something like that that dvd tricked me so yeah 99 percent of the movie takes place in this rest home with these dark drab long hallways so it was not shot in texas no it was shot in california there you go so yeah now we're we're later in the night and we meet our next character, the the thief of the convalescent home of Shady Rest. Who is just so evil. Yeah. She seems such a like a nice sweet lady. At first. Until she goes up to a lady in an iron lung who was played by the producer's grandmother. Who looked just who was just laying there serenely, smiling at this uh, Oh, you've come to visit me. Yeah, and I she's have like petting her head and smoothing oh, her hair. Oh, hello. Yes, I'm okay in my iron lung. Oh, you're taking my glasses. No. You took my glasses. It, 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 it's just horrifying yeah. to see. It's just, I, it, this this woman in the iron lung, she can't do anything to stop her, and she's just lying there. It, 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 at least she can see, for crying out loud, she can see around her with her glasses but no this thieving old bitch just walks up and just oh pretty glasses i'll take those and, 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 and this poor woman of the iron lung is left with nothing she's just left with nothing she can stare at the boring blurred ceiling of this awful place she can't even do that she's staring at the mirror she's looking back at herself she's staring this, back at herself all blurry this horrible horrible <laughs> thieving woman and not only that, she steals chocolates. Yeah, that somebody, she, she some, wanders off and steals so a tin of chocolate, squits from outside someone's room that, with a bow on it. It's obviously a gift. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to her room. And there was a deleted scene that they had for that where she's first in the room and she's pulling out, she opens up a drawer and it's full of all her pilfered items. And like she's pulling out all these things. She pulls out this set of pearls and puts it around her neck and just looking at it yeah. and then pulls out a picture frame that has this kid's photo in it and it, it's almost like okay is this hers because she has kind of she has this smile on her face and then she looks deeper at, at it and pulls a picture out and crumbles it up well you know what though there's even a kind of sad note to her because it's possible it, it well then again it, it did look like she had a pretty nice room compared yeah. to uh, there were levels of rooms in this shady rest home because uh well let's uh, elvis and his roommate are in a bare bones 
nothing kind of room. Uh, yeah, it, and so far we've only seen the two rooms, mm -hmm. but they are large rooms. So yes, I are. think we are also looking at Elvis at this point doesn't really have anything. It's not Elvis with a ton of money. This is Elvis with nothing. And his roommate, who we find out because of Medicare or Medicaid, whatever it is, was the only thing keeping him there. So neither one of them had the money to furnish their rooms and put anything to kind of personalize it. This lady, her room's at least painted, and she's got her dolls and things. Her room was a palace compared to Elvis's. Yeah. Uh, but now she's in bed eating her chocolate and there's a nice little squeaking noise and something moving under her blankets. Somehow, instead of cockroach, she turns it into three words. Cockroach. I'm going to squishy you cockroach. It's a good thing. Every horror movie has to have at least one character who you don't mind seeing dying. Don Cuscarelli even says they had to have the first character to die. And when you have your first character to die, you don't you don't want to make them people you sympathize for. They have to yeah. have some kind of irredeeming quality. And this woman had one in spades. Yes. But yeah, so she didn't she didn't squish the cockroach so much as... It bit the living crap out of her hand. We never see the cut. It's just a lot of blood. That causes her to panic and she rolls out of bed onto the floor and beats the living crap out of this bug. With her cane, I believe. Yes. And then flips a blanket over. We see it's not a giant cockroach. It's a giant scarab with a lot of ooze underneath it. So yeah, it looks dead, right? N not so much. It, it, it peeks its little head out. And then looks to the side and we get our first glimpse of our mummy. And a scarab, for anyone out there not familiar with the term, is a type of beetle that shows up often in uh, Egyptian iconography. I, I, I believe they were considered sacred by the ancient Egyptian pharaohs and such because they were, I, I think, a, a, a one was supposed to push the sun across the sky or something. I don't know. Seeing one in the movie tends to presage the mummy showing up and we did get to see him finally. Oh, we not, didn't get a good look at him, I don't think. No, and he seemed to rise from the floor. But, you know, she she doesn't quite get killed then. She somehow manages to escape, which, I mean, face it, for a mummy movie, the rest home is the perfect setting because you don't have to have your female character faint. No, you don't. As Bruce Campbell put it, um, you can do the, the Bubba slow step because nobody there moves quick. So... With her being more mobile, it kind of makes more sense what she, how she was managed, how she managed to get away far enough to where she can wake up Bruce Campbell by holding on to the side of his doorframe before being drug off down the hall into who knows what kind of weird, strange things. We know eventually as the film progresses that she had her soul sucked. Yeah, but we'll get more into that because right now all we know is there's a weird bug and there's a mummy. There's something with a cowboy hat that yes. ro rose up in her room. So the next time he's a, he wakes up, though, is Heidi Marnout. Yeah, she's wearing this tiny little skirt, and she's just going through drawers and going through all, all this stuff. And we find out that she's Private Ryan's daughter and is throwing away his purple heart and all his old military photos. Rather heartlessly. Yeah, she she looks at him and's like, okay, well, whatever. It's like I can't get anything for this, so who cares? But Elvis asks for the purple heart and a and one of his pictures. But at least to remember the guy by. Yeah, something to remember him by, and he'd always he he was proud of his purple heart. And when Elvis asks her for these items, she bends over in front of him to pick it up and doesn't care that she's given him a view because he can see right up the right up home stretch. Yeah, he says. She saw me as so physically and sexually non-threatening, she didn't mind if I got a bird's eye view of her love nest. It was the same to her as a house cat sneaking a peek. Which is pretty uh, which is pretty raw for the man that used to be king of rock and roll. Yeah, and if you think about it, when, when can you think of when he couldn't get any woman? As he long as he was alive, he could get whoever he wanted. When you're, when you're a rock star at that level, I could imagine he did not have a hard time finding someone to spend the night with no. at any point in his career. Callie, the name of his roommate's daughter, um, mm -hmm. we know she didn't care one bit about Elvis. Um, didn't ma didn't matter. And Elvis says, says, I felt my pecker flutter once like a pigeon having a heart attack. Then it laid back down and remained limp and still. 
Of course, these days, even a flutter is kind of reassuring. That is the the whole height of the sexual tension in the room with these two. So the Elvis thing, I guess, doesn't matter unless they know you're Elvis. Oh, no, it would not. Oh, especially when supposedly you've been dead for years. Yeah, you've been dead since 1977. Uh, which I have to wonder, is uh, is Bubba Hotep set in the late 80s or early 90s? They or don't really it... say a time. The movie... The, the movie was done, I can't remember if it was finished in 2001, it was released 2002, and it said present. Oh, there you go. So, present day, that's, that's all it takes me. So yeah. It's probably set in 2002. But then again, Friday the 13th also says present day. Well, and it meant the present day in 1980 when it came <laughs> out. You know, we're 15 minutes into this movie, and we still don't even have a name for this character, other than him saying he was the king of rock and roll. How did I go from the king of rock and roll to this? Yeah, that's as close as we have to an introduction, because this is when Ella Joyce comes in and calls him Mr. Half, and he has to correct her and says, no, I'm Elvis Presley. Oh, you get confused sometimes, don't you, Mr. Half? As the nurse and Elvis interact, we, we learn the basis of the of Elvis's situation. We learn that she considers him to be a man named Sebastian Half, and he, as Elvis, is either convinced of the truth of his own identity and is insane, or is actually Elvis, and he has this bizarre story of how Elvis stopped being Elvis and switched places with an impersonator of his own. And Her side of the story is that Sebastian Half was an Elvis impersonator who had a hip gyrating accident, broke his hip, fell into a coma, and has been there ever since. And it's been 20 years, and he come out of the coma with a few problems. That's her side of the story. His side of the story is, I don't got no problem. I know who I am. I'm Elvis. They obviously don't believe him. They give a little bit of condescending laughter and some words before she leaves the room with Callie, still laughing at him. They don't take him seriously. He, no. He's seen as just another one of the rest homes, colorful residents. This one who actually believes he's Elvis. It's, it's kind of clear that she doesn't take him too serious. Before they, before the two leave, though, the nurse does say she will be back to do that little thing that has to be done. We don't, we don't know quite what that is, but she doesn't look like it's going to be a pleasant experience. Somewhere between 25 and 26 minutes in, that's when we meet the other half of our dynamic duo for this movie. That's when we see Ozzy Davis for the first time, talking about he's really President John F. Kennedy. Which is, uh, well, given that Ozzie Davis is a... is a Old black man. ...was a incredibly respected black actor in his time, it, it, it comes off as immediately comedic at the fact that he is claiming to be JFK, who is famous for, well, many things, but not for being a black actor. If you watch him, the way, the way he looks around, the turns he does, even when like the focus isn't on him, Everything he's doing, it's always like he's looking looking to see if there's another assassin. He, he's always got like the postures perfect. When he leaves his room, he doesn't leave in just a robe. He's got his suit jacket. I mean, he's always got to look presidential. And Ozzie Davis brings a sincerity to something that if you want to do something that, that you want to be taken seriously, but you want to go bonkers with it, you put somebody in like Ozzie Davis who can bring that sincerity to the most bonkers of things i think i think in a way ozzy davis is sort of the heart of the movie in a lot of ways because elvis is more the prickly exterior of the movie and and if you if you want to get to the elvis's you know soft interior you have to wait a good bit throughout the movie until he actually reveals something about himself i think and it Whereas takes with, jack uh, to bring it out yeah and with ozzy davis's portrayal of jfk he there's it, it it's kind of so ridiculous you have to love it but yeah, so he's he's talking about the, the scar on the back of his head and they put a piece of his brain in a goddamn jar back in D.C. And they, now he's got a bag of sand up there instead. I'm um, thinking with sand here. Then Elvis looks at him and says, John F. Kennedy was a white man. And then that's when we find out that he was dyed. They dyed me this color. All as, over. As, as close as I can get to Ossie Davis's amazing portrayal, which... Yeah is uh, not that close. The first time I remember seeing Ozzy Davis, and I know I've seen him in other things because I've watched a lot of things he's done, but it was always things where I didn't think too much about who was in it. Hmm. The first time I really remember seeing him was I'm Not Rappaport with Walter Matthau. 
first thing I ever saw him in was uh, Evening Shade with Burt Reynolds, where he had a, a regular part on this sitcom with Bruce Reynolds and Hal Holbrook and Michael Jeter. Uh, about I don't even remember what the show was about. Basically, it was Burt Reynolds, you know, at a, a, in a sitcom. I assume it had something to do with cars. Anyway, uh, Ozzie Davis was lent the lent every episode a sort of certain gravitas with his amazing voice. He was also the bait shop owner in Grumpy Old Men. It's night again, and Elvis is now dreaming. And what was he dreaming of? Well, th- this one, I think it, it it gives it helps give a feel towards his attitude towards like just the, all the condes- condescension because he's dreaming about his past years um when he was sebastian when he was playing sebastian half imitating himself on the top half of the screen we also get the nurse and callie who now are fawning over him and yes we believe you and they have smiles and it's they 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 love him they're not laughing at him if only they knew but yeah, so that, that's when we get the flash to his hip gyrating accident before he wakes up and realizes the room is cold and he's got to pee. And this is when you have, I like scenes when they set the stage, but they don't make it look like they're setting the stage. Because mm-hmm. this is one of those where he reaches under the bed and you know he's had a busted hip and he's been in bed the entire movie, you've, you've not seen him walk anywhere. The only time we've seen him outside of bed is the scene where we first meet Jack. But he's got a walker next to him, so it's implied that he can walk. But we've not seen him move. So he reaches under the bed for the bedpan and decides no more pissing and crapping in the bed. And he's going to actually make it to the bathroom this time. But the room is cold, so he's got to turn on the space heater. To heat up the room and this whole time you see bedpan you see space heater you're seeing all these things setting the stage but it seems like just kind of a n- natural thing mm-hmm. it's not like they're forcing this oh we need we need to figure out how can we do this and just oh put it in let someone else figure it out so he, he goes into the bathroom and hears a noise and when he looks out he sees a tin of chocolate that was one of the other items he asked for the purple heart, the photo, and the tin of chocolate, which looks a lot like the tin of chocolate that the scarab came from that killed the old lady. The thieving old lady, who we hate. Yes, but to me, I mean, it looks like looks almost like the same tin. So it's kind of like, at first you're thinking, is it have something to do with this tin of chocolate? Because now we've seen it twice, and both of them had that big fucking bug. And the bug does show up in a moment uh, after uh, well, Elvis is... Getting ready to go to the bathroom, doesn't it? Well, he he comes back out and to inspect what, what's going on. Why is this tin now on the floor? And when he lifts it up, he sees this giant bug and calls it a big bitch cockroach, which I think mm-hmm. is even better than cockroach. It is a bit better, yes. And then the fight scene with his big bitch cockroach. I think he kills it with a bedpan, doesn't he? No. He, okay, so initially the bug jumps at him. And crawls up on the wall. Um, He reaches back. He's going to grab a fork and grabs the spoon by mistake. Um, But he's going to fight it. Like he's getting ready to to pull some karate moves and fight this big bitch cockroach. And then it flies at him and he panics as it's flying around the room laughing at him. Um, And then he grabs the bedpan and there was one critic called it the fastest bedpan in the West. (laughs) <laughs> he just catches it in the bedpan and slams it against the wall. But then there's no noise or anything, so he has got to check, but well, did I actually catch it? And it's like holding on on the inside of the bedpan. Which is another scare. Yes. He flips it over, and it flies out of his face. He falls back, and as at one, at one point in the script, he said, Bruce Campbell said that his character, when he falls back like that, is described like a turtle when it's flipped over. <laughs> because of his belly and the hip and the age and everything, he can't really flip himself over and get up. Once he falls yep. on his back, he's there for a while. So now he's laying on the floor, and this big bitch cockroach is coming at him, and he reaches back, finally grabs a fork, stabs it, and then swings his arm over and electrocutes it in the space heater. I think he electrocutes himself a little bit too, Yes, he? he electrocutes himself a little too. When he stabs it, he even says... Even a big bitch cockroach like you should know, never, but never fuck with a king. 
and then he electrocutes it. But the scarab was added because scarabs are also tied to Egyptian iconography. And the whole idea with the scarabs was they were going to be wherever the mummy was because something to do with the scarab and the mummy with the way they were entombed. Yeah. Just tied them together. But the budget, they couldn't keep them. Later, when we see him walking down the hall, he's supposed to be followed by scarabs. Ah, no, I, I, I was just wondering if Joe Arla- if if they if the Beatles appeared in the Joe R. Lansdale uh, novella. I, I, no, because they were added I, in for this movie, so they weren't in the original were. story. No. Ah, that was well, when I, I, I said also, there was very few things that were added. That was one of them. I also want to say Don Carl uses these uh, giant scarab beetles as a source of scares in a few scenes. And, and I think that one has to mention that a, a small, dangerous object flying around a would-be victim is is just... Somewhat reminiscent of the Phantasm Sentinel Spears. Yes. Uh, he from, he does uh, like to go with that. He does. It, just having a small, scary, very deadly object. He, he said be... his idea, though, was once you got this big bug and you know what it can do, how can we make this scarier? I know. Let's make it fly. <laughs> and it works. Yeah. Even though I will say the scare looked a little rubbery. Yeah. And having those vocalizations in added some humor to it which i think made that scene so much better but that music just the way it amps up and gets goes from so far everything's been kind of a twangy kind of an elvisy sound this goes to like more of a modern rock yeah and just kind of gets there's, like a nice little thump to that beat add some intensity to it i think there's like a guitar note to yeah something like that um so he's just killed the bug now what do you do? You go oh. and look for somebody and to say you got a we got some bug problems. But what happens when there's nobody around? There are not many night attendants in this uh, rest home. There doesn't seem to be many day attendants in this rest home. No, there aren't. Yeah, so he he goes to look for somebody, doesn't find anybody, but he hears some noises. So I mean, what do you do in the middle of the night when you've already been in this fight with this big bitch cockroach, and now you're hearing noises? And what is it you're supposed to do? Well, you could crawl up, crawl back into bed and just, you know, hope it's over. But not Elvis. No, sir. You find out it's a good thing he didn't because Jack is laying motionless on his floor in a room very similar to the Oval Office that has pictures of Jack Ruby, Lee Harvey Oswald, a diorama of Dealey Plaza with the book depository and a tiny Oswald action figure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's pretty good. Uh, it's it, it's kind of the it's a, it's a it's a nice little setup for a guy who thinks he's JFK. Yeah, he sees him laying on the floor. Obviously, you got to check that, right? Mm-hmm. So he goes to check and sees this mysterious scar. Who knows? Maybe he does have a bag of sand, or maybe he was just a Kennedy conspiracy theorist who had some kind of brain injury and how thinks he's actually Kennedy. Sadly, we we don't get to see Ozzy Davis's uh, side of the story the way we do Elvis's. It kind of comes off like Ozzy Davis may actually be delusional, where whereas Elvis, you get the feeling mm, it's feasible. He, you cheer for Elvis throughout the movie, and he, you wind up convincing yourself that he is Elvis. And as you as you said, the writers of the the writer of the fil- of the story, Joe R. Lansdale, has stated flat out that it is Elvis. But I I don't know if you really get that that convincing a case that uh, Jack is actually JFK. Yeah, I don't really get that convincing of a case, but his sincerity kind of makes you want it to be true. Yes. I mean, the and this the sweetness of the character is is like I said is the heart of the movie. And I just it it feels like a little bit of a short shrift that uh we don't get the same level of uh empathy with him that we do with Elvis. Well, I think having more into him would really change the tone of this maybe yes um because it it would it would change the focus on like what what i feel is the the point of the movie but yeah so then we we get a great improv scene after this when um when the administrator shows up as the nurses are helping jack into bed and elvis is talking with the administrator played by reggie bannister um which like we mentioned before was from most prominently the phantasm film Really, all he had for these two characters was they'll just talk about the bug. So this mm. whole conversation was just improvised, talking about, uh, do, do I look like an ichthyologist to you? 
It's just a brilliant line that came out of nowhere. Bugs the size of a peanut butter and banana sandwich. What do I care? I got a growth on my pecker. If you're having an argument with somebody or some kind of a discussion and you you say, what do I care? I got a growth on my pecker. Is that conversation going to stop? It's like, if you want an end, you want a conversation ender, there you go. There you go. But yeah, the whole thing improvised. And Bruce Campbell said that the size of a peanut butter and banana sandwich seemed logical to him as a, a way of to measure something. Back to the whole growth on his pecker. Now we find out what that little something was that the nurse was talking about before. That little something that had to be done. She has to put a salve on. Yes, this is the the steroidal ointment scene, which is which looks uncomfortable for both of them. Yes, she does a brilliant job of just looking like this is something she really does not want to do. Like something that just completely disgusts her but she still has to try and be professional but yeah so she's putting this ointment on and for quite a while i might add and he starts flashing back to like all these depressing things and then flashing to all these all the events of the last couple days with the fight against the scarab and and callie bending over in front of him and all that and he has a reaction yeah he he says that he he hadn't had a boner like that in two presidential elections and uh I, and the nurse steps back and looks at and i believe she goes mr half yeah and and it started with him talking about how like a doll like this handling me without warmth or emotion 20 years ago just 20 man I could have made with a curly lip smile and had her eaten out of my asshole. Yeah, I, I believe he makes a joke like to her face, uh, something along the lines of, "Why don't you get in there, give him some company?" Yeah, something she like she says to him, "I think you need to take a cold shower," and his response was, "You get in there with me, and I'll take it." <laughs> and then tells her, "Come on now, why don't you pull it a little?" And and to be fair, uh, from the look on her face, it, it looked like she must have been impressed to, a little bit by the size. Yeah, and the the reaction when when he's talking like that is kind of like, "Oh, you dirty old man," kind of thinking it's funny. And then when she turns around, just a little smirk on her face. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, what what did you really think? The movie is a horror comedy, as we've said uh, a few times, I think. And uh, much of the comedy comes from just the awkward funny circumstances. Situations. I'm sorry. It just, it just, I think, comes from a lot of awkward situations. Awkward situations involving the care of the elderly that can arise. And something arose. It kind of sounds like it's putting a crude tone on the movie. But if you think about Elvis in general, again, I go back to he, he lived his life knowing he could get whoever. Probably. And now he can't get anything and he's got nothing. So just to know that something still works, it kind of is a little boost for him. Well, that and he also, he comes to the conclusion, I think, uh, because of this uh, physical reaction he's having, which hadn't happened in a long time. He, he, he realizes that something has spurred life in him again yeah and that's Uh, when he realizes that that little distraction of him thinking about the exciting events has made him feel alive again the the day-to-day drudgery of watching the janitors come in and out of the room is has been disturbed he can finally look at the world around him with uh questions again unfortunately we don't see him happy for long no we don't no because it cuts right to one of the most depressing meal times it looked like just bologna on white bread with some canned green beans on the side it's yes it's not a pleasant uh, meal time for them no and we finally see kimosabi played by larry who is Pinnell. in full lo- lone ranger regalia uh, yes with the uh, mask and the hat and he's he's got his pistols and and he's rambling he's talking about ambush and seeing us under the bridge and yelling about his boots Okay, Elvis we know is Elvis. Jack we're not sure if it is Jack. Kimasabi we know is just crazy. Well, we we know there's something, but we don't know if he's crazy or not. But he sure seems to be. And Elvis said that they they used to be friends, but now Kimasabi doesn't even recognize him. So it's most likely a form of dementia that Kimasabi has. That's what it's looking like. But yeah, he he tends to be a bit on the batshit crazy side. But he's crazy like a fox, as we see later. Um, unfortunately, now we get this weird scene of Elvis laying in bed and we're sh- it's shot from a- above him 
And I don't know if you noticed this or not, but mm. it looked like David Boreanaz in old age makeup. I didn't notice that, no. Yeah, next time you watch this, when it shows that cut, right at first, it looks like him in old age makeup. And it, it was the one. weirdest thing. Either but, way, yeah. they did a great makeup job for the old Elvis look at the... Uh completely changing the texture of Bruce Campbell's skin and uh, giving him like liver spots. And... Yeah. They airbrushed the liver spots on and they had, a, they talked about it early on that they had to, that Elvis had to be lit like one of the old time starlets hmm. because if not, then you'd see all the cracks and wrinkles and all the, the, the makeup and you would see all that. So he had to be lit like an old time starlet. He, he did a great job per, portraying somebody that no one's done before. Uh, no one's done it in a context like this, that's for sure. Kurt Russell and how many others have played Elvis, but they they always went to a certain point. No one's put Elvis in a rest home before. No, uh, and that's uh, it's just part of the conceit of this film. That, yeah. uh, what if Elvis was alive and living in a rest home in Texas? At this point, he's alive and living in a rest home in Texas, but yet when he was actually alive, his daughter was nine when he died. So when he's woke up right here by this girl in a door, that was what Don Cascarelli was saying. That was his inspiration is if the last time he saw his daughter, it was nine. And so far he's brought her up a few times. Like, would she even care that I'm still alive? And, and the regret, that memory of her in the doorway as a little girl, that's all he's got left. And he can't even see her face anymore. One has to wonder if uh, perhaps the Elvis in this film, uh, Feels some regret for having to abandon fame, but also abandon his family. The family thing comes up recurring yes. through the movie. But he also has a, uh, what if Priscilla was here? Would we still want to fuck? Or would we just have to talk about it? It, it, it doesn't exactly sound wistful. And luckily, he, he doesn't have to think too much about the daughter. Because this is when Jack comes in. Because mm -hmm. it's loose. We still don't know what it is. But whatever it is, it's loose. And... I believe that that's when they have their nice little conversation, isn't it? I believe so. Yes. And he, he wants to, to enlist Elvis's help. And Elvis is just like, leave me alone, man. I got to sleep. But not for long. No. And Jack goes through this l nice little speech trying to convince him. And yeah, I'm thinking of sand here. That's a great line. It is. And the, the delivery is brilliant. And then he makes Elvis, or he tells Elvis, I know you're the real Elvis, or I know you're Elvis really Elvis. Attention. And that, yeah, that gets his, gets his attention and makes him swear he didn't know, or he didn't have anything to do with Dallas. He didn't know Oswald and, or Jack Ruby before they could oh, be yeah. friends. Kennedy is so paranoid at this point that he, he requires uh, Elvis to uh, disown any allegiance he's ever had to, like, the conspirators. And, well, he, he also said, their, their rumors were that you didn't like me, but I thought about it, and if you didn't like me, you could have killed me the other night. So that might have something to do with, with this paranoia about swear that you had nothing to do with that because the rumors were that he didn't like him. Or it could just be everybody that he's got to be friends with has to not have had anything to do with his attempted assassination. Um, but yeah, so this is when this is when they go in and see the nice graffiti on the shit house walls, which is rather unusual. Yeah, a bunch of nice little hieroglyph looking figures that apparently translates to uh, Pharaoh gobbles donkey goobers and Cleopatra does the nasty. They find graffiti on the walls. Yeah, and they deduce and that it must be a it, mummy. It must be an Egyptian soul, or it must be a soul sucker, and probably Egyptian because of hieroglyphs. He knows it's a soul sucker because he was asleep the other night and he woke up just in time and found this thing with his lips. The mummy had his lips on his asshole. So yeah. So how, how do you remember how he knows what what it said? Uh, he had his ancient Egyptian scrapbook, I believe, didn't he? The, the Everyday Man or Woman's Book of the Soul by David Webb. It also has some pretty good movie reviews about stolen soul movies in the back. Fine, fine reading. He had quite the little library in his uh, room. Yes, and the art for it was it was amazing. We go from the bathroom to outside, where, and this is when the nurse is outside smoking, and there's some kind of electrical disturbance in the shed. And, and I think Reggie Bannister makes his cameo there too. At yes, one point. he 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 shows up and scares Ella Joyce. Um, they have a nice little conversation about somebody needing an enema, and she's the only one who can do it. Well, if you're an administrator, are you going to give an enema to somebody, or are you going to have one of the nurses do it? I would hire more. I'd hire more than one nurse. But what that is her shift? 
Because she seems to be there early in the day, the afternoon, and apparently on night shift. Either way, it actually kind of hurt my feelings later in the movie when Elvis told her off. Because it was like, she's been so nice so far. Oh, you were mean to her. I felt sorry for her. So yeah, they, they have... They have that conversation while the mummy is eyeing her from behind, and I don't know. The sounds of it, the mummy eyes everybody from behind. It doesn't look so much like he's eyeing her behind as much as he's eyeing her from behind. But I don't know if it's because he's just waiting for her to leave, but it's not till after she leaves that he comes out, and we see that he's got another victim laying there on the floor. We, we don't even get the hearse drivers for, for this death. No, we don't. The movie's taken a more serious tone by this point. Yeah, we, we haven't really needed much comic relief because we've had quite a bit between um, Elvis and Jack already, and it's still trying to ramp up a little, so we're not done. We are not. No. We, we still got a little bit of ramping to do before the real bonkers stuff starts. But this is this is when we go back to Jack's room, though. When we get the ding dong conversation, where when Jack asks Elvis, "Would you like a ding dong?" and Elvis kind of he he doesn't really look down Jack's body, but the gaze kind of looks like he's looking down. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I think it's more just kind of like, wait a minute, what ding dongs? And and Jack says, "Well, I don't mean mine. I mean a chocolate ding dong. Of course, mm-hmm. mine would be chocolate now that I've been dyed." I completely forgot about that part. And, and that's one of those that, from Ozzy Davis, just the way he does it and that delivery makes it that much more brilliant. Because, again, it's one of those just, you want to have a bonkers thing said, but you want it to be taken seriously? Give that line to him. No, he definitely uh, carries, he, he does more than his share of heavy lifting throughout the film. Him and he and Campbell make a fine duo, despite the age difference. And this is when we go to Kimasabi's room. He's he's woke up by his roommate struggling on the floor with the mummy over the top of him. And as the mummy pulls down his roommate's pants, Kimasabi pulls out his guns. He doesn't go down without a fight. No, he, he starts saying asshole and shooting away. Unfortunately, he only has cap guns. But we don't really see, I mean, we don't know, Was did he effectively get the mummy away from his roommate or did the roommate die? We don't know. I don't know. think we ever... Well, uh, I believe there is a, a scene afterwards where you see uh, Elvis and Jack with the administrators and they have to decide not to tell uh, well, the yeah, administrators what's but going on. We go from the mummies pulling down the roommate's pants to and Kimasabi pulling out his gun saying asshole and the mummy looking up at Kimasabi right back to Jack's room where they're talking about um, like what's going on and trying to figure out, well, why why is there hieroglyphs in the bathroom why, why would he do that and jack says well if he eats he's got a shit so he'll be uh-huh. shitting soul residue so when he's in there he's got to do something to pass the time same as what we would do so he writes on the walls and as they're talking about you just turned into so much toilet water decoration that's when they hear the noise and the mummy comes walking down the hall with kimasabi following it firing cap after yes. cap after cap he comes walking down the hall. We get the second connection and see the brutal murder of... Papa Hotep. We see him go from, from alive Hotep to dead Hotep. And now he's Bubba Hotep. Uh, the mummy starts walking away and goes through the doorway. And Kimasabi's following him down the hall. Just asshole, asshole, asshole as he's shooting away and dies of a heart attack. So we know the mummy didn't get Kimasabi's soul. No, he did not. And uh, Elvis and Jack uh, mourn Kimasabi with some some respect. And I think Kimasabi actually inspires uh, a little bit in Elvis and Jack what they need to do to actually solve what's going on. Yeah, he went down fighting. And and this this to me is probably one of the worst parts of the movie. And not like worst part like it's bad, just worst as in of all the things that happen, I think this is the worst of what happens. Because if you didn't at any point think that, oh yeah, these nurses aren't callous, when they just go and, oh, he's dead, and they just take his mask off and just toss it down on his chest, it's like, okay, this man, he he was a lone ranger. This And just to go and take his mask off like that? It's not exactly respectful. No. And then toss it down and kind of, well, whatever. And then when the body's taken away, they still just leave the mask there on the floor. It was important to the man. Yeah. And that's when the, the questioning that you were talking about, that's where that comes in with the administrators and everybody asking and asking questions. And they're, you know, what are you going to do? We can't tell them the truth. No, we'll believe us. Yeah. And so once again, we got scolded. This time we got quizzed about what happened to Kimasabi, but neither of us told the truth. 
I mean, who was going to believe a couple of nuts? Elvis and Jack Kennedy explaining that Kimasabi was gunning for a mummy in cowboy duds, some kind of Bubba Hotep. And that's, ah. when our, that's when our mummy is finally named. And we're about 54 minutes into this hour and a half movie, and we finally get a name for our, our mummy. They go back and see that the, the mask is still there and just kind of discarded. And Elvis picks it up and realizes it was something important and saves it. Along with uh, his friend Jack's Purple Heart, his roommate. Was his, his roommate was named Jack, you said? No, his roommate was, his roommate was um, Bull. There you go. Elvis calls him Bull. I just have been calling him Private Ryan because he's played by the the same actor that played the old Private Ryan. Private Ryan at the end of Private Ryan in the Arlington Cemetery. Yes. And I am horrible with names, so I go with what makes it easier for me to remember. I couldn't remember his name either. I've I've watched the movie a dozen times, but I can't, I can never remember Elvis's roommate's name. Um, I just remembered it because the only time I've heard a character named Bull was Night Court. Ah. So it made it stand out a little bit for me. Um, But yeah, so now we're at the scene that you were talking about where outside and um, the nurse comes out to try and get him to go inside because it's time for that little thing again. And Elvis blows up at her. He snaps at her. He says flat out, Mondra, leave me alone. I'll oil my own crankshaft from now on. I'll I'll lube my own crankshaft from now on. There it is. It's a great line. But I thought it was kind of appropriate, personally. Well, it's appropriate for Elvis, like, taking a, a firmer stand on his own his own life. He's he, he's not going to... He's decided he's going to fight uh, the forces of entropy instead of just letting himself waste away. And, and he's commented multiple times about how no one takes him seriously anymore. And, and we've constantly been seeing everybody just being condescending to him. So I can understand how, okay, you know what? I'm tired of it. He's just starting to get his mojo back. He's he's moving around easier. And at one point he says like that the walker just glides. It's like he didn't even have to, to move it. Hmm. He's feeling good. Yeah. He's not smart enough to say, I'm feeling good, but not good enough to try and go down this hill. But he he went there, dang it. And he was pretty damn tired when he got back to his room, as I recall. Yeah. Well, when he was down there, he he did see the bus, and we did get flashes of the bus from the the psychic connection. Um, But he sees the bus. The bus, he sees the bridge, and he's starting to piece things together. But yeah, when he gets back to his room, you can tell he's been through it. Yeah, he is not... uh, He is very disheveled. He is not fresh. He's sweaty, and he's... It, and he looks like he, he looks like every moment movement hurts. Yeah, so. he's got wet spots on his knees. Not the rest mm-hmm. of his legs, just on his knees and uh, on his chest. So at some point, he was on the ground. That walker would have come in handy to help him get, the, get up after, after yeah. he kneel down. But... Now that he's back in his room, it's it's time for him to lube his crankshaft. Which I think she left it for him. I don't know about you. I mean, you could tell the look on his face. It was painful. But I didn't set out to time this. So I can't tell you how much longer it took her than it took him. So, I mean, y- you can chalk it up to it was it was painful. So he didn't do it as much because it's harder to inflict the pain on yourself. Was she taking her time? Was she maybe enjoying it a little too much? He clearly wasn't enjoying it when she was doing it, except for that one time. Jack shows up again. And he's got some more news, I think. I I got the woman that calls herself my niece to take me to the newspaper morgue. (laughs) And if you're not familiar with the newspaper morgue, basically it's where in like an editorial office where all the old archival newspapers or magazines, where all that's stored. They figure out that the story about the the bus crash and the the mummy and all that and jack decides that he's gonna go to sleep while it's still light because this thing only feeds at night so go to sleep set an alarm and then drink a lot of coffee it's a good plan it it makes elvis realize that uh he doesn't really have anything left but what he does have is his home and the, Mm. the people in it that's his home and that's what the closest he's got to family he says it ain't much but it's all i got I'll be damned if I let some foreign graffiti writing soul sucking son of a bitch in an oversized cowboy hat and boots take my friend's souls and shit them down the visitor's toilet. Many a great turn of phrase from Elvis in this film. Yes. Are we going to tell them how it ends? I, I've been tempted to leave that out, but I think I, I think to really make the point I want to make about this movie, we're gonna spoil the ending. <laughs> 
and I don't know how familiar you are with Elvis, but he kind of, he was known for really always wanting to be a hero. He was also into the occult too. So this plays into that. Right. That, oh, Elvis was fascinated by the occult. Yes. Maybe Elvis was just a, a smart Southern boy who was scared of the hoodoo when he hurt, when he came near it. Who knows? I do not. Probably, uh, probably a lot of people. And we're just Elvis idiots. Yes. We're, uh, Yes, we undoubtedly are. But yeah, so he decides he wants to be a hero, and he gets on the phone and calls up Jack and says, we're going to kill us a mummy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a- after they they sneak out to fight the mummy, Jack asks Elvis what's what he's got hanging around his neck, and he says, it's my medicine bag. The, the Indians used to wear him in the battle. He, he's got all, all the things he's collected, all the important things, because they have, they have the most powerful mojo, the mucho mojo. He has a... Uh... He has Kimasabi's mask. He has Bull's purple heart. And a picture of his daughter. A picture of his daughter. You know you know what this brings us to, though, right? What's that? This brings us to the fight scene. The fight scene. The, yeah. This, the epic conclusion. Yeah. And the, the, the mummy shows up, and we, we get a fight scene between Bubba and Elvis, with Elvis trying to use his, his walker to, to fight the mummy, but... It's kind of one of those things like grabbing a tiger by the tail. Now that you got it, what are you going to do with it? Yes, it doesn't go well at first. They, Elvis puts up a valiant effort, but the mummy is able to use magic tricks on him to uh, get away. Jack comes up behind the mummy. The mummy turns around and sees him, and that's when he kind of just turns and walks off and magically disappears. Uh, Jack tells Elvis to stay there. He's going to go flush him out and gets knocked out of his wheelchair by the mummy. And unfortunately, it's too far away for Elvis to get to him in time with his walker to try and keep the mummy from sucking his soul. But luckily, here comes the wheelchair. Crazy wheelchair's got a mind of its own right then, and it's headed right toward Elvis. He just kind of turns around and positions himself so when the wheelchair comes, he can just plop his butt right into it. And luckily, he gets there in time to keep him from getting his soul sucked. Thank goodness. But yeah, he so he lights the mummy on fire. There's some nice little words exchanged at one point. But do you remember what the power or the words of power were? I knew they didn't rhyme well. You nasty thing from beyond the dead. No matter what you think or do, good things will never come to you. And if evil is your black design, you can bet the goodness of the light ones will kick your bad behind. The hell kind of me- magic words were these? What kind of decoder ring do you get with this? It doesn't even rhyme well, man. They and sound it, much better in Egyptian. They had to have sounded much better in Egyptian. The, the next little set of words we get from the mummy, eat the dog dick of Anubis, you asswipe. But this is when Elvis says it's it's time for A-C-T-I-O-N and gives his rebel yell and speeds off for the mummy. Jack gone. Yep. Everybody in, in the, all, as far as the administration, all the nurses, everybody has just been super condescending. Elvis has been, he's tried to be nice to everyone, except for the one time he snapped at, well, okay. The one time he snapped at the nurse and when he was tired of being talked down to in front of Callie. But when Jack died, it didn't matter to Elvis if he was some kook or if he was John F. Kennedy. To him, to Jack, he was Kennedy. So that's what Elvis was gonna d- treat him like when he when he died he didn't just say like okay sorry you're dead he saluted him and called him mr president but i just i liked the way that throughout the whole thing there was a, just a different level of respect and it didn't matter if you're crazy or not it was that's who you were to you so that's what he was going to treat you like and Which i just thought nice. thought it was it's a nice message it's like you know what even though i don't agree with it for you that's your reality so let you have your reality it's not hurting anybody which is a lovely uh, lovely sentiment that goes all the way back to Chekhov, from what i've read and elvis charges the mummy bravely with his mucho mojo risen and they get into a nice little fight in the wheelchair. I think Mo, I think Elvis gets the flame power to work. He sprays him quite a bit with the the gasoline rubbing alcohol mix that's in the the garden sprayer. Um, and then they go over the edge fast enough to where they fly off, and you can see the Elvis wig fly back off his head. Uh, thank you. I'll notice that from now on. <laughs> Did I just ruin that scene? No, a little bit. Um, I'll be. But yeah, so they tumble down. You hear a lot of bones cracking. It's not good. And when we get to the bottom, we see Elvis laying on the ground with a rib poking out through his nice white jumpsuit. He tries to fight the mummy a little. 
The mummy's getting the best of him, and and you know Elvis is done. He he's not gonna let the the mummy get the best of him quite yet, even though he gets beat over the head with a big stick a couple times. Um, but yeah, he manages to light the mummy on fire, and a, a major part of the drive for Elvis was to avoid the the mummy eating the souls and shitting them down the crapper. Mm-hmm. Yet when the mummy is burned, the souls escape. It would seem yes. So does that mean that he didn't really shit him out the crapper and he just was in the bathroom for the sake of going in there? Or maybe, uh, maybe he, he, one of his victims was in there and he carved it when he was done? Maybe the mummy had a way of purifying the souls a little bit uh, so they could go straight to heaven and he crapped out the bad parts and sent the so good it's, parts. So the soul that. residue that he crapped out, it's kind of like twins where the good parts would escaped and he was flushing down the veto down the crap. But yeah, so now the, the, the souls have escaped, the mummy's dead, and Elvis is laying there saying... I felt something inside grating against something soft. I felt like a water balloon with a hole poked in it, which I think is just a great description. And somewhat sad because yes. uh, we've been with Elvis since the beginning of this movie, and uh, now it's starting to feel like time to say goodbye. He, he's just laying there thinking about how he's not really, he's not scared of dying anymore because he knows he still has a soul. He managed to to. To keep his soul, and he's thinking about all the the people that are up there that will still have their souls. And the universe has one last little gift for Elvis as the stars realign for him to say, all is well in Egyptian hieroglyphs again. And we get the the only real ending you can have for Elvis. How else can, can you end an Elvis movie without thank you? Thank you very much. Elvis passes away from the land of the living and enjoys his reward on the other side. You know how you have your, your favorite actors? Yeah. Or not. sometimes it's not even necessarily favorite, but just actors you like. And they pass. And it makes you want to go back and pull out some of, some of their movies from your collection and just rewatch. Mm-hmm. This is one of those where, heaven forbid, it's anytime soon. But for Bruce Campbell, this is that movie. This is one you're going to go back to. Um, and, uh, yeah, th- there'll be some evil. Th- th- there'll obviously be evil dead in there, but I'll watch a bunch of movies and I'll cap it off with this mm. because if you go through Bruce Campbell's movies, there's nothing like this. No, there are. And this this isn't Bruce Campbell being a Bruce Campbell character. This is Bruce Campbell being an elderly Elvis. This was Bruce Campbell acting, not Bruce Campbell playing a Bruce Campbell role. No. And uh, I, I think Bruce Campbell is a better actor than he often gives himself credit for. It's one of those movies that you watch it, and even with the absurdity, to me, it's the absurdity of the movie reflects the absurdity of some of Bruce Campbell's movies throughout the years. And then just the way he dies, it's a, uh, you know what? This is, I, I finally did something meaningful. I I stood up, I killed the, the bad guy, I saved all these people, and they'll never even know it. And to me, it's like, it's almost like, I don't think Bruce Campbell knows, and hopefully he knows, but I don't think he knows the extent of the impact he's had on people. I I think uh, I think he's aware of his fandom. Yes, I th- I think he's aware of his fandom, and I know I know he has to have some kind of an inkling on uh, some kind of an inkling on the the number of people that have been affected. I also think he's smart enough to realize that even though he's he's seen quite a few and heard from quite a few, there's even more than what he could imagine. But this movie, the effects done by K and V, who they had they had a history with Don Coscarelli already. But they had a, they had more of a history with Bruce Campbell, and they agreed to the to do this movie for cost because of that. Yeah. Um. As far as the art and the, the sound and the the gra- the guys that did the the graphics and the number of people that got into this movie for the only reason of Bruce Campbell, they heard Bruce was involved and they. It's like, yes, I want to do it, or yes, I will do it, or please, can I do it? They all wanted to be involved because of him, or not all, a lot of them wanted to be involved because of him. And there's so many other people out there that they they thought, well, where am I going? I can't do anything. And then you have Bruce Campbell, who 
just him and his friends get together and with hardly any money make a little movie and now they're huge and now they're superstars and, and people see that and it's like i have a couple friends we could probably figure out something to, and it just the inspiration to so many and to get into so many de- different fields i think what it is is when he goes or no Okay, let me rephrase that. I hope what it is when he goes, it's not the same of no one will ever know. It's more like I hope he knows. Hopes he knows how how loved he is by yes. his audience. I can sincerely wish that for Mr. Campbell as well. Um, but yeah, th- this this is one of those movies that when 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 it comes to the end and he dies, you kind of feel you feel the death. Yeah, because you've actually got into that character so much because you've spent the whole movie with him. I just think one of the main draws of the movie is just uh, is uh, Bruce's performance as a rude, crotchety, old, cantankerous Elvis that is just, he's just beyond giving a shit about so much stuff. He, he's just an old guy with a bad hip who's got a growth on his pecker. They aren't telling him much about what, what the growth is, and the day-to-day for him is just watching the janitor come and go out of the room, and whatever great glories he's lived in his life are gone, and he can only deal with what's left, and Bruce Campbell just sort of mined that for all the gold you could find in that kind of role. I think he, he definitely found a lot of that gold. Yeah. But yeah, the number of people that were willing to do that for almost nothing just because of him being involved. Well, it goes to show how much he's loved in the industry, yeah. too. But yeah, that, I mean, that, that's what I was saying. For me, this this movie was a little different. It's something that the, that has a little bit more of a, an impact, I think, mm-hmm. than I was expecting it when, has, when I it, first it saw it. It has a lot more heart than you'd expect from a mummy versus an Elvis. From, from a mummy versus Elvis, Elvis versus and John F. Kennedy, when the first line is talking about jacking off and busting a cancerous, pus-filled growth. Yeah, you don't expect the movie to go that far when that's how you start. No. But yeah, so that's that's Bubba Hotep. May it live forever in glory. What's your take on? I I think it's uh, I I mirror most of your opinions on this. I I I I consider it a, a highlight of Bruce Campbell's career. I mean, I remember when when it came out on DVD at Best Buy. I went and bought it the day it came out, and I still have the DVD in its slipcase, which is in pristine condition because I love it. Um, I have the DVD in the slipcase. I have the the one that that's the limited edition with the jumpsuit. I do not have that. One. I have that one, and I have I didn't get the Blu-ray, but I do have the 4K, which has some never seen before things on it, which unfortunately I've not had a chance to watch yet. Uh, so yeah, I asked you on the last one, so I'll ask you again: if there was anything in this movie you would change, what would it be? Not a damn thing. Yeah, do I have to pick something? No. All right then. You can you can say you wouldn't change a thing. It's fine. I I think if anything, I I would kind of like to see with the that deleted scene with the old lady and and all this stuff in the drawers and everything. I would like to see that in its entirety. But I could see how taking it out could help the pacing of the movie. Where would you rank this movie on your favorites list? Favorites? It's up there. Especially because I, I saw it at a very impressionable time in my life when I was just discovering what uh, horror films could be again and uh, rediscovering my love of uh, the genre. And uh, I'll I, make this easier for you. Where would it rank on your Bruce Campbell favorites list? Because to just to say favorites, there's too much out there to really say this one on an overall top. favorite. As far as, as far as performances of his that I know of and really treasure, I, I think it's got to be the top i think it's this is one where he shows he really gets to show off uh his chops more than a lot of pictures he's been able to be in yeah i think it, it has some of that nice bruce campbell physicality when he's trying mm-hmm. to do some of the the moves and everything but it doesn't have your standard bruce campbell lines the over-the-top acting this is Bruce Campbell actually, I think, trying to play a serious role or trying to play a role seriously. He carries the movie. His version of Elvis is a joy to behold and a joy to listen to. And uh, and I I really just don't have enough good things to say about the movie. They they all really got into the character. Like Ozzy Davis was amazing at Jack. Larry Pinnell for Kimasabi. All of them really got into the roles. Bubba Otep, uh, it sort of sets its own bar, but then it it rises above that bar many times over. Yeah. It's a it's a movie that uh, plays by its own rules, but excels at everything it does when it 
needs to. Because you do see you you see a lot of character growth in this short time. You do. Because we're only dealing with a couple days. You were saying that the growth on Elvis's pecker is a uh, is kind of emblematic of his evolution as a character. It's it, it's emblematic, I think, more of his of the sad fact of his life in that home and uh, what changes is his attitude about that life in the home and in the way he becomes more proactive about protecting it and uh he stops obsessing over the growth and starts obsessing over something that matters you know he rises up to be a hero like you said elvis always wanted to do yeah i i can't really i can't fault it i know I there's i know there's things here and there that people are going to say well what about this what about that and it's not for everybody it has a oh. it has a sense of humor to it that i can see it's not for everybody no but um, it's I one could, of those, I'd say, everybody should at least watch and decide for themselves it's, if it's for them. Hell, I showed it to my parents, and they liked it. They forgot about it quickly afterwards, but they enjoyed it. Yeah, don't, um, like the, don't let the absurd premise turn you away from it. No, it's, uh, and the mummy is, the rodeo-looking mummy is really, uh, it's really quite well something done. to hold. Before we wrap all this up, anything else you have to say about this? There's one thing I wrote that there's a sweetness to the movie that works from beginning to end. Everything from Elvis's mojo bag and his sad tale of identity switching to the magic words JFK brings to the showdown. There's a kind of gentle familiarity with how the characters interact where it just feels, feels like everyone has the best intentions, except for Elvis's roommate's daughter, who was just throwing out her dad's purple heart. She was kind of a bitch. There's a lot of things you can get out of this. There's a lot yes. of different messages, and it's almost like every way you look at it brings you to another meaning. So it's a it's a multifaceted gem that rewards different viewings, uh, and, and that's just I, I think that's a qualifier for a a, a a qualifier for a movie being a great movie. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, are you going to get that many meanings out of the English Patient? Like, uh, can you can you turn English Patient around in your head and look at it from a new angle, or is it just it hits you over the head with a message once and that's it? That's the message. Yeah, this is this is an hour and a half of a wild ride that you never never thought you knew you needed to watch Indeed. and after you watch it you realize i needed that i think that's about it for this one i'd say so um and yeah, i was gonna say in advance good luck editing this i i, I tried to keep it linear that okay. was the main thing was trying all to keep right. it linear all right um so yeah anyway uh yeah if you if you liked what you were listening to or want us to to keep trying so we can get better uh, yeah, subscribe, like, thumbs up, stars. What? Send us hateful letters. N no hateful tell us, letters. Tell us why we suck so much. Y yeah, tell us why we suck, but give us uh, ideas for ways to improve, not just tell us we suck and that you hate us. We're going to see. We have to keep We have to keep working at it, sir. Graham, we gotta keep uh gotta keep building that audience. We gotta get there. Yeah, we we gotta we gotta get those people. But in order to get those people, we we need you guys to to help get the word out. So the more you like, subscribe, thumbs up, stars, comment, all that good stuff, the the more those funky algorithms can get us out there to everyone else. And we are grateful for every single one, by the way. Thank yes, you. Yes, we are. So uh, on that note, uh, that that is it for me, Grim Weed. And that is it for me, the conductor. And. Uh, Thank you, and we'll we'll see you next week with what what movie? The Fifth Element. Oh, that that'll be a good one. See you then. Mm -hmm.